All righty. Well, clearly I'm being uh, punished here for being too confident uh, after the first two lectures last week, everything going well and smoothly, but uh, we will, I still can't get the iPad to work for whatever reason, but we will work our way through this without it. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, hopefully everybody's back. Looks like most people, if, if not everyone, uh, got back. Maybe a few people who didn't uh, fell asleep or whatnot. Who knows? All right. We have seen the pressure changes that take place during the inspiration and expiration or inhalation and exhalation. Again, those terms are interchangeable. And as we hinted at, uh, the reason for that is the contraction and relaxation of muscles. As we change the pressure uh, inside the lungs by changing the volume of the lungs, we uh, produce a gradient between what's going on in the outside world and what's going on in the inside world. And so air moves in and out. The same way solutes move down a concentration gradient, pressures, get, pardon me, gases move down a pressure gradient. So all of the mechanical events that are involved in our pulmonary respiration form what we call the respiratory cycle. The same way we had a cardiovascular cycle, which were all the mechanical movements of the heart that led to the pumping of the blood. These are the mechanical events, the contractions of muscles that lead to the movement of our air. And again, there aren't too many big surprises on this as we look at it. When we started the cycle, and again, it is a cycle, so we could go any uh, arbitrary starting point because it is a continuous process but we will start with inspiration. Because as we talked about, and again, when we talk about respiration, we're talking about your normal resting breath, which you're sitting here doing right now. Uh, inspiration is an active process. Again, what skeletal muscle is primarily involved in your normal resting breath? Diaphragm. The diaphragm, absolutely. So we have that diaphragm, which is the muscle that is responsible for your normal tidal breath. However, if we want to take an exaggerated inhalation, because we're frustrated with the uh, problems that Zoom is having, we have those other muscles that can be involved in that as well. Our external intercostals, our sternocleidomastoid, our pectoralis minor, and our scalene. All of those are our accessory muscles that help to assist in that if we want to take an exaggerated inhalation, right? And as we talked about, when we actively contract all of these muscles, whether they're just the diaphragm or all of them together, uh, what happens to our thoracic cavity volume? It increases. Right, and so what happens to our thoracic cavity pressure? It decreases. And so that causes a pressure gradient and air moves in which direction? Into the lungs. There you go, air moves into the lungs. So again, not too complicated, very simple, very straightforward. And here's the pretty picture that goes along with that as well. Here we see the diaphragm going down. We see the, there you go, the uh, external intercostals contracting and it swings those ribs up. If you remember, one of the things we talked about in our cardiovascular, uh, pardon me, in our skeletal system way back in 430, is the ribs basically work like the handle of a pail. If you think of them like a handle of a pail, or one of the easiest ways to do this is to uh, interlink your fingers in front of you. Like as you interlink your fingers in front of you and keep your hands in your lap, and then as you swing your arms up, there is now a lot more space in between uh, your chest and your arms. And so that's basically what we do. Our, it's like a handle of a pail or the swinging of your arms. We are increasing the volume, and as we increase that volume, the pressure goes down, and as the pressure goes down, the air comes in. Then, for a normal resting breath, our, our exhalation, or expiration, is passive. This again recoils on the, uh, the elasticity of the muscles and the elasticity of the thoracic cavity. So our diaphragm, our external intercostals, all those muscles relax and we rely on the elasticity, the recoil of the thoracic cavity, the recoil of the lungs, that compliance. And when that occurs, as we said, not surprisingly, our thoracic volume is going to decrease. When the thoracic volume decreases, our pressure is going to increase. 
And when we have that pressure gradient, which way does air move? Air moves out. All right. So normal passive uh, exhalation for a normal resting breath. However, oh, and again, here's the pretty picture that goes along with that. Our diaphragm goes back up to its normal space. Our uh, muscles relax, our ribs come back down. And again, all of this is relying on the elasticity of our muscle, the elasticity of our ligaments, the elasticity of our lungs. So we get, we stretch out the rubber band and everything recoils and goes back to its original shape. That decreases the volume, that increases the pressure, and air goes out. However, we also have the ability to do a forced exhalation where we are vigorously pushing the air out of our lungs. In that case, it is an active process. So again, back in ancient times, on your birthday, they would put candles on the birthday and you would blow it out. Nowadays, people are no longer allowed to come over for your birthday. You are no longer allowed to breathe air out towards other people. So again, you have to fan it or whatever people are doing now to turn out their candles. Uh, but back in ancient times, you would blow them out. And so for that, that would require uh, active or forced exhalation. That forced exhalation is an active process. Again, you can feel that, assuming hopefully nobody's close to you in your environment. <sighs> when you breathe out, you can feel those muscles contracting. And again, as we talked about, those are the internal intercostals forcing the lungs down, uh, I mean the ribs down, serratus anterior squeezing the ribs, uh, the abdominal muscles, which basically pull down on the ribs. And again, all of those things help to decrease the volume. And the key is we get a rapid decrease, right? That's really the key with this. We get a rapid uh, decrease in the volume. That rapid decrease in volume leads to a rapid increase in pressure. And then of course, that is going to lead to the, oops, rapid movement. Uh, of air out. So again, with this, we are getting that much more vigorous, much more rapid responses, dramatic responses, bigger responses. If you remember, if we go back, and let's cheat, let's go all the, all the way back. Notice that was the one number we didn't really look at when we were looking at this chart. Oops, there it is. Is the actual values. Notice if we look at the actual values, we're only looking about a one to two millimeter of mercury change. A normal resting breath, you know, may only drop the pressure to like, um, you know, 758 or may only go up to 762 or something like that. Yeah, the normal resting breath, we're talking about very small pressure changes and a very small movement. Only about a half a liter of air is being moved inside. So when we're doing this forced, we are getting bigger changes and more rapid movements. All right, questions on that? Excellent. So these pressure changes are what allow the air to move into and out of. And that's really the key. The key is setting up that pressure gradient. One of the things to understand is that pressure gradient, and again, it's the same thing in diffusion. As we talked about, if you had a beaker, and on those beakers, on one side there's 50%, and on the other side there's 10, or another there's 50%, and the other it's 40. Notice the fact that it's 50% glucose doesn't matter. What matters is what's on the other side. If it's 40 on the other side, there's a very small concentration gradient, and you get slow diffusion. If it's 10 on the other side, you get much more rapid diffusion. And it's the same thing here. It's really the difference, the portion of it, that pressure gradient that determines how rapidly the air is going to flow. So that's why when you make big changes with that big inhalation or big exhalation, 
you're making big pressure changes and you're getting a lot of flow. But the other thing that affects the flow is the resistance that is in the airways. This is one of the things that you're gonna be playing with, oops, gotta go back, that you'll be playing in the Physio X. Not only are you gonna be calculating uh, your volumes and capacities, which is something you are gonna be responsible for doing on the exam, but you're also gonna see how uh, adding more resistance is going to change the movement of the air. So they are inversely proportional. So if you double the resistance, the movement of air halves as a result of that, all right? Now notice when we look at the airways, right? When we think of it in terms of how much resistance is there, you would think that it would just be overall size that would make a difference. After all, we know the bronchioles are tiny. And as we talked about right, using a straw to try to get things to move through it, or when we talked about blood vessels, changing the diameter of blood vessels uh, to allow more blood to flow or less blood to flow, you'd think the tiniest uh, airways, the bronchioles, would have the highest pressure, but notice they have the lowest. The reason for that, of course, is that while they are tiny, there are millions of them. So again, you will, these are tiny little straws, but when you have one million straws, then there's plenty of places for that air to go. And uh, that way the resistance is relatively low. Notice it's a little bit higher uh, when we first enter in that primary bronchi, when we're in the primary bronchi, uh, when we are working our way through the trachea and things along those lines. Uh, but the resistance is higher, obviously, than the bronchioles. There's only one trachea, there's only two primary bronchi, there's only um, five secondary bronchi, and so on and so forth. But remember, they're massive, they're really, really large. So they have a very large lumen, uh, they have a huge uh, space inside of them, so the resistance is relatively low. Where we see the highest pressure, as you can see, is at about the seventh order of division. At this point, our bronchi have gotten relatively small, but there isn't a massive number of them yet. If you think about too, as it transitions, right, we have those cartilaginous rings that become the more cartilaginous plates. We have more muscle. So when we're here at these medium-sized bronchi, this is where they have the highest resistance. And this is where small changes in the size of our airways can have huge effects on resistance. If you remember when we talked about blood flow, I didn't make you learn the equation, but basically flow was equal to one over uh, the radius, you know, to the fourth power or whatever it was to figure out how much uh, that flow would change, how much that resistance would change as a result of small changes in diameter. And we see the same thing here in the airways. Here in the medium-sized bronchi, which have the largest muscle, they're smaller in number, but not nearly as big as the primary, secondary, and tertiary. Here is well, small changes in the blood in the smooth muscle, like the um, effects of the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, things like adrenaline, things like histamine. This is where those changes in diameter can have huge effects on the resistance and therefore huge effects on the flow of air. One of the things that I mentioned that I want to talk about uh, at the end, but I will go ahead and emphasize it now is if you go, perfect. Uh, if, oh, no, that's not where I wanted to be. Hold on. Did I close it? I may have accidentally closed it. Oh, no, here, here, this is what I want. Can you guys see that? Yes. So the study area. So again, I'm in the Mastery at a &P. What I've gone uh, back here, we'll go back to the home here. Here is the study area in the master at a &P. There are, like I said, there are easy ways to get to all the study tools and things like that that you want to play with. But one of the easiest ways to find all of the resources they have here, like again, you can go to the art labeling or you can go to all those things. But one of the easiest ways to focus on what you're doing is to come over here to the chapter, uh, study by chapter. So if we go to study by chapter and we go to the respiratory system, uh, here is where you can get the chapter quiz and the chapter practice test. Those are things that definitely can be help you. Here's where you can get access the e-texts. 
But the other resources that are in here are things like the interactive physiology. The interactive physiology is excellent. Here it has the stuff on pulmonary ventilation we just are in the process of talking about here. Uh, here is the control of respiration, which is really great. Uh, here are uh, some more, uh, again, e-tech stuff. But then we also have glossary, glossary flashcards. Here is the interactive physiology. But there's also some great tutors, like the MP3 tutor, um, the BioFlick. And this is where I wanted to show you. On the BioFlick, where it talks about gas exchange, in here, it actually talks about the flow of, uh, of the blood. I was playing with this and looking at this video earlier. And um, somewhere around in here, too far. There we go. This is what I wanted. So if you notice right here. Oxygen diffuses from the. No, that's not what I wanted. I know somewhere in here when, you were, when I was playing with this, I think it talked about uh, the effect that um, the fact that things like histamine and uh, and epinephrine and things along those lines can have on the um, oops, closed the wrong thing on that. So make sure you are taking advantage of all the resources uh, that we have here. So again, you've got this great study area, and this great study area has got the tutors, got the physio X, which again is an assignment you have to do but it has a lot of other great resources that can help you to be successful. So make sure you are taking advantage of those resources, especially now uh, where having as many different modalities to understand these things. I can't stand up in the classroom and demonstrate it the way we can. We're not gonna get the opportunity to play with the bio packs and, and do some of the fun things that we were gonna be able to do like using a spirometer and things along those lines. So you have to really take advantage of these resources to get uh, the information you need. Uh, the instructors uh, and I have been talking a lot, biology in particular, our instructors have been talking a lot, and, and we're trying to find the best ways and the best things, the best practices, ways that we can provide this information for you. But one of the things uh, that is becoming apparently clear is that as hopefully you are aware, these are classes that are vitally important for your ultimate career goals. And gaining this information is something that is going to be necessary and something that is required for you to be successful moving forward. And a lot of the onus for that success is being shifted to you as the students. You are going to need to be a lot more independent and a lot more resourceful on how you make sure you get the process. You're going to have to be a lot more active in the learning process. You can't just sit back and be spoon-fed this information anymore. You're gonna to have to be a lot more active in going out and finding the information and make sure you get this information. Because again, ultimately, what the tests are gonna be like online are not ideal. And, and they may not be a true indicator of how well you know this information. You know, one of the problems, one of the issues that we have with online exams is maintaining the integrity. It's too easy with online exams to cheat. And what you have to realize as students who need this information to be successful, while it may be easier to get the grade that you want in this, that's not your goal. Your goal in this isn't to get the grade that you want. Your goal in this class, uh, probably more than any other class you guys are taking, is to gain this information and be successful. I know you guys are starting to take your placement exams and, uh, you know, CPAPs or whatever the heck they are, the tests that you guys are taking, all the alphabet soup tests that you're taking that you need this information for. So cutting corners in this class may help you in this class, but they're not going to help you in the long run. So you have to remember the onus of this is going to be shifted to you as we work towards this online, to you to find the ways to get this material and to be more active in the learning process. All right, help put my pom-poms away. All right, excellent. So Take home message from this here is resistance affects the movement of air. Where we're gonna primarily be able to move that and affect that is here in the medium sized bronchi, where we have large smooth muscle, where the change in diameter is going to have the greatest effect on the flow of the air. So again, as we talked about, uh, things that affect and restrict the airways are parasympathetic nervous system, uh, this is one of the problems when you have that uh, anaphylactic shock, right? Uh, when you have a vasal vagal reflex where you get an inappropriate activation of the parasympathetic nervous system, uh, things along those lines, or 
eat that poisonous mushroom, that stimulates your parasympathetic nervous system and your airways constrict as a result of that. Whereas, as we said, epinephrine dilates the airways. That's why when someone has anaphylactic shock, uh, we give them that shot that is going to, or uh, they, you know, they, they get the thickening of the mucous membrane from the histamine. We need to dilate those airways and get those things through. Now, we can measure the movement of air using a spirometer. Back in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in college. Oh, no, I don't want to change this. Oh, I'll steal a little corner of this. Uh, basically, a spirometer back in my days was a bucket. And it was a bucket that was filled with water. And inside of that bucket was a second bucket. So we had one bucket upside down inside of another bucket that was filled with water. Then what you had was a hose, and that hose would basically go inside the second bucket. You would blow air into the hose. That would produce air bubbles inside here. And as you produce the air bubbles, that would cause the bucket to rise. The bucket would have little markers on it, and depending on how much it rose, would tell you how much air you blew into it. And so in that way, you could see how much air you were pushing out of your lungs. Now, could you measure how much was being breathed in with something like this? You know, if you tried to breathe in here, you'd basically suck in water. So it wasn't a very efficient method, uh, but the good news is that the machines have gotten a lot better. And in fact, that's what we are dealing with now. Uh, if we were in class, we actually have a spirometer uh, that you would be blowing into and have the opportunity to do this activity. But you are still going to have the opportunity to do this with your physio X. So in your physio X, you can actually measure the inward and outward movement. And what you would see uh, at the end of that recording would be something like this. The activity that you actually would have done in class was what we see here. You would take three normal breaths. So we see an inhalation and an exhalation, an inhalation and an exhalation, an inhalation and an exhalation. You would then take a maximal inhalation, filling your lungs to as much uh, volume as you possibly could, and that would be followed by a max exhalation, forcing as much of that air out as possible, and then you would go back to your normal breathing after that. And so what you would get is a recording that would look something like this. So that would have been the goal of using that spirometer. Now, once you get those measurements, you'll be able to then calculate, uh, and again, you'll be doing this in your Physio X, how much air is actually moved. If you remember, when we looked at that first changes in pressure and how much air, a normal resting breath, as we said, is about 500 milliliters. Does that mean that every single person that's listening to this right now uh, has 500 milliliters as their resting tidal breath? No. No, of course not. All right. There are all sorts of different factors that can influence those. Uh, age, body size, gender, physical condition, all of these things are factors that can measure those. So I will be giving you typical numbers, 500 milliliters for a normal resting breath is a typical number, and it's good to have an idea of the actual amplitude of these things, but do you need to necessarily mem memorize 500 milliliters as the resting breath? No. What you do need to understand as we talk about these volumes and capacities are their relationships to each other. So as we talk about the relationships of these to each other, that is something we do need to pay attention to. And I guarantee on the exam, you will be given numbers and will be responsible for calculating uh, these types of volumes and capacities. So understanding how they relate to each other and understanding their definitions, what they mean, these are going to be the important factors that you're going to be involved in understanding. All right. So let's go through them. There are 10 important volumes and capacities you are going to be responsible for. And just uh, with absolutely no hope of this actually working, I will try to share my iPad one more time, and it did not work. All right, so instead we'll bounce back and forth between the lecture and my drawing that I did on the whiteboard so that we have a chance to see how these calculations will work. 
I need to bring that back up. I need to bring that back up. And I need to bring that back up. Perfect. Uh, hold on one second. Uh, oh, nope, I don't want to do that. Okay, perfect. All right, excellent. Okay. Uh, perfect. All right. The first, as I mentioned, is our resting breath. However, we're not going to use resting breath. We're going to use the appropriate anatomical terms. And again, we're dealing with volumes and capacities. So what we think of as your normal resting breath, and that's really, again, we want to make sure that we can define these terms and know how to calculate them. Is our tidal volume. The tidal volume is the total amount of air you bring in during normal resting breath. If we go to our whiteboard and look at that, uh, remember as we were, I uh, don't have any fun things that I can do. All right, we'll just do a drawing and change the color, work our way down. Basically what we want to measure for our tidal volume and I'm just going to abbreviate it here, TV, is going to be to measure from the top of one of these waves to the bottom of one of these waves. So that calculation right here, from the top of the wave to the bottom of the wave, that is our tidal volume. That is our normal resting breath. So this is bringing in 500 milliliters, breathing out 500 milliliters, breathing in 500 milliliters, breathing out 500 milliliters. So basically from the apex to the base of this curve, that would be our tidal volume. All right. Excellent. But as we've mentioned, we have the ability uh, when we're taking your normal resting breath, you're not filling your lungs to their capacity. You have the ability to fill your lungs to capacity. There is extra space in your lungs that you can fill with air, and that is what we call the inspiratory reserve volume. So again, if we are thinking in terms of definitions, this is the space in the lungs for extra air, right? That is above what we normally breathe in. Right. So we have that above what we normally breathe in. So if we go back again to our whiteboard, notice, let's change the colors here. A little red now. Uh, our goal now is to identify our inspiratory reserve volume. And if our goal is to understand that, and again, knowing the definition, it is the maximal amount of air we can breathe in, but remember, it is above what we normally breathe in. It doesn't include the tidal volume. The tidal volume, this down here, is what we would normally breathe in. So our inspiratory reserve volume is the amount of air we can bring in above what we normally breathe in with our normal tidal volume. And that is our inspiratory reserve volume. And notice if we go back to the lecture, we can see that uh, that is approximately a little over three liters, 3.1 liters or 3,100 3, milliliters of air, right? Notice it's about six times what your normal tidal volume is. So the capacity to add more air to your lungs is quite large. All right. Notice also when you take your normal exhalation, you're not emptying your lungs. There is a lot of additional air that is staying inside of your lungs. 
And so again, if we switch back to our whiteboard illustration, and we have to change colors again, so now we'll go to uh, we'll pick orange. Our goal now is to understand the expiratory. Um, let me cheat, put it over here. Expiratory reserve volume. Oops, don't know. That to be orange. Expiratory reserve volume, perfect. That expiratory reserve volume is going to be the extra amount of air that we can move out. So if you think about it, it's down here to the maximum amount we can move out. But again, it's out of what we normally breathe out. So it's from the bottom of our tidal volume. So it's not just um, all the air we can move out, but all of the extra air we have in our lungs that can be moved out if we wanted to move it out. And so again, we want to worry about our definitions. So let's go back and add a definition to that one. So again, our expiratory reserve volume is the extra air in the lungs that can be moved out. But again, this is above what is normally moved out. by the normal breath. All right. So these are three important volumes we have. Our tidal volume, our inspiratory reserve volume, and our expiratory reserve volume. Questions on those? All right, now, if we go back and think about it, when you've blown out as much air as you can, and you can't move any more air out, are your lungs completely empty at that point? No. No, no as we've talked about, there's still gonna be some air in there. Uh, for one, you're not able to completely flatten your lungs, so you couldn't force all the air out. I mean, I guess if we had one of those steamrollers, we could do that. But as we also talked about, you don't want to completely empty your lungs. As we talked about, the two sides of the alveoli could come together if we got all the air out, and then it'd be really hard to reinflate it again. So we want to keep some air in there so that it doesn't collapse. That would be a bad thing. So what our residual volume is, and again, we care about definitions, our residual volume is the additional air in the lungs that cannot be moved out. All right, notice the expiratory reserve volume is about 1200 milliliters. And notice uh, the same thing, oops. Uh, our uh, residual volume is about the same volume, 1200 milliliters. So if we go back to our picture, and we need to change colors again, we'll go pink this time, and pink this time. Uh, if we were to look at our residual volume, that residual volume, basically, it would be from the bottom of our aspiratory reserve volume, basically, to having a completely empty lungs. Now, using a typical spirometer, is there any way to measure the residual volume of air that is in there? No. No. No, like I said, the only way to do that would be to hook you up to a spirometer and run you over with one of those big, huge, you know, like flattener things uh, so that we could squeeze all of the air out of you. That'd be the only way to be able to do that. It's impossible to measure, but we know that that value is about 1,200. All right. Uh, hold on. Hello. No house phones. All righty, excellent. Um, so those are our four important volumes that we have. Now that we have these volumes, we can start talking about capacities because capacities are how these volumes are going to relate to each other. So anything on these four volumes before we can start putting them together to understand our capacities. 
All right, excellent. Blank stares, blank screens mean that we totally understand that. So let's talk now about some of the important capacities. The first is our inspiratory capacity. Notice, remember, our inspiratory reserve volume is the extra air we can breathe in above tidal volume. Tidal volume is the amount of air we normally breathe in. So if you put them together, you get the inspiratory capacity, which, as the name would indicate, is basically the total amount of air you can bring it, breathe in. And not surprisingly, you calculate that by the tidal volume plus the inspiratory reserve. This is how much you normally breathe in. This is how much extra you can breathe in. So you put them together. And again, remember this one was about, and again, these numbers are not vital for knowing. Uh, that's gonna be 500. Uh, this, as we said, was about 3,100. You put them together and that is 3,600 milliliters. Now, do we have to memorize these numbers? No. No, however, if on the exam, for instance, I gave you, um, let me cheat, if I told you that the inspiratory reserve volume was 4,000 milliliters, oops, sorry, the expiratory capacity was 4,000 milliliters, and I told you that the inspiratory reserve volume was 3,300 uh, milliliters, should you be able to calculate for me what the tidal volume would be? Yes. Absolutely, and so this is the type of thing that I'm going to do on the exam. I will give you some of these volumes and capacities, and by understanding the relationship, you need to be able to calculate the others. And again, we'll keep the numbers relatively simple like this. There is no calculator that is gonna be needed for this. You won't even have to take off your shoes and socks to do the counting. It should be pretty simple and straightforward. But as long as you understand these relationships, you should be able to do the equations. All right, questions on that? Excellent. Now again, if we wanted to go back to the pretty picture, because this is something that you're going to be doing on your uh, Physio X, if our goal then is to, and let's pick a new color, uh, we'll go with yellow, to understand your inspiratory capacity, then obviously that inspiratory capacity is going to be from the bottom of your tidal volume all the way up to the peak of your no, and that's too far away. Oh, no. Uh, I want that. There we go. Bring it over here. Perfect. Uh, inspiratory capacity is, like I said, basically includes the tidal volume. So all the tidal volume and all the extra air you can bring in with your inspiratory reserve. So it would basically be calculated from here up to here. That is our inspiratory capacity. The next important capacity is what is called the functional residual capacity. Now, we think of that inhalation, that air that we bring in as being, as having the job of uh, allowing gas exchange to take place, all right? That's what we bring it in for, for gas exchange to take place. But anytime there is gas in our lungs, that gas is able to participate in gas exchange, even when we're breathing out. And that's really the key with the functional residual capacity. Again, our goal is to define these things. The definition of the functional residual capacity is basically the volume of air uh, that can participate gas exchange uh, after a normal, whoops, normal, resting expiration. So when we take that normal breath out, again, not a forced breath out, but just your normal breath out, there is still a lot of air left in our lungs. If you remember, we talked about our expiratory reserve capacity being about 1,200, oops, 1,200 
uh, milliliters. And we also talked about how our residual volume of air is about 1200 milliliters. So all of that air that is remaining in our lungs after we take a normal exhalation can still participate in gas exchange. And that's why it is the functional, right? By functional, what we mean is it's capable of participating in gas exchange, residual capacity. So it's the air left over, residual capacity, that can still participate in gas exchange after a normal expiration. And we calculate it with the expiratory reserve volume plus the residual volume. And so, of course, if we go back to our pretty picture and think of it in terms of that, again, what we are thinking of is, and let's go with, uh, I haven't used green yet, let's use that green. Um, basically, from the bottom of a normal exhalation all the way down basically to the emptying of the lungs. All right, so this involves all the air we can normally move out and all the air that we can't move out. And those together uh, are the uh, functional residual capacity. All righty, <coughs> excuse me. Questions on that? Yeah, I have a question. Yeah. How is it functional if you can't exhale it? Uh, because in this case, by functional, what we mean is it can participate in gas exchange. Because it is still in the lungs and still in, capable of getting to an alveoli, it can be functional in that it can take on carbon dioxide uh, from the blood and it can give oxygen to the blood. So that's what we mean by functional. We don't mean movement, right? And here's the other thing too. Think of it this way. That residual volume, that 1,200 uh, milliliters of air that is in your lungs, is it the same 1,200 milliliters of air that was there last week? No, of course not. Or, yeah, or even two weeks ago, or even one breath ago. Right? Think of it this way. You have a glass. Well, heck, soda cans are my favorite, right? If you have a soda can, are you ever able to empty a soda can? No. Anybody, yeah, anyone ever drank a soda out of a soda can before? It is impossible. There's always a tiny bit left in. Think of it this way. There's that tiny bit left in. If you were to refill that soda can with water and drink it, there would still be a little bit left at the bottom. But would that be the same little bit that was there before? No, we're always adding new air to it, mixing with the air that's there, and then moving some of it up but there's always gonna be a set amount of it. It's gonna be constantly changing. Each breath you take, the which air molecules stay and which ones go is gonna always change. But there's always gonna be that little bit of air left in there. And that little bit of air left in there can participate in gas exchange. So that's why it's functional. All right, did that help? Yes, it did. All right, excellent. Any other questions? Great question, any others? All right, perfect. Then let's go to our next capacity. And this is the vital capacity. Again, because we care about our definitions, our vital capacity is the total amount of air you can move. So when you take that maximal, fill your lungs to its complete capacity, Exhale as much air as you can. That is the total amount of air that you can move. And not surprisingly, if you look at the equation, it is how much air you normally move with a normal breath, plus how much extra air you can take into your lungs, plus how much extra air there is in your lungs that you can move out. That is your vital capacity. So notice if we go back to our whiteboard, our vital capacity, and let's use a light blue for this one, uh, is the total amount of air you can use. So it's from the top of the topmost amount that you're able to, to the most amount you can move out. That is our vital capacity, how much air we are actually able to move. Again, again. Uh, 
from the very top to the very bottom. And as you can see, it includes basically the inspiratory reserve volume, your title volume, and your expiratory reserve volume. So you put those three together. All right, your vital capacity, remember this is about 500. This is about, you know, whatever we said it was, uh, 3,100. Uh, oops, where's my, that's what I want. And this is about 1,200. You put those three together and it's about 4,800 milliliters of total air you're able to move. That is your vital capacity. However, if I fill my lungs up, is that how much air is in my lungs? 4,800 milliliters of air? No. No, because remember, there's always that little bit of air in the bottom that we can't get rid of. And so when I fill my lungs up to the total lung capacity, I have all the air that I'm capable of moving, my vital capacity. And again, if you think about it, this, this, and this, all of this together is my vital capacity. So there's really two ways I could calculate this. I could calculate this as my vital capacity plus my residual volume, or I could all put all four of them together. And if we put all four of them together, we see that our total lung capacity is about six liters, right? So again, with all the hoarding that's going on, I'm sure like me, you ran to the liquor store to get the most important things there. And those were those nice big two liter bottles, uh, Purple Passion. Uh, <laughs> For those of you who don't know Purple Passion, uh, in ancient times, and by ancient times, I mean when I was in high school, uh, one of the best things to get uh, if you really wanted to get uh, messed up on Friday night after the football game was Purple Passion. Purple Passion is basically a grape soda with Everclear. And uh, it would get you hammered, and the uh, color of your vomit was so beautiful, and it was almost like a rainbow. It was amazing. And a couple of years ago, they actually brought it back. So it's hilarious. So think of those three two liter bottles of whatever your, you know, two liter bottle of alcoholic beverage of choice is. That's basically what you have inside of your lungs. And of course, if we're going to go back to the pretty picture, our, now what color's left? We'll go, uh, I don't think we use, oh, we use purple for title volume. We're not a color choices. So we'll just go with this brown. There we go. If you think about it from, and I'll cheat and put it over here, the very top all the way to the very bottom, everything that we are able to move plus everything that we can't move, we put all of this together and that is our total lung capacity. All righty, questions on that? No one has any problems with anything that we've talked about so far and being done with this? I have a problem. How many volumes and capacities did I say you needed to know? And you're missing two. I'm missing two, absolutely, I'm missing two. And that two, and I'm gonna cheat and actually go back to our picture first. The two that remain, uh, and I will use uh, this weird green for this. The two that remain all involve this title volume. If you think of the tidal volume and what it is, this is the amount of air that comes in during a normal breath. So you're taking that normal resting breath as it comes in. In this tidal volume, when we're talking about the air, and again, remember, it's a small amount. And I'll throw this number, even though, again, it's not a number we need to worry about memorizing. It is a number that is useful in this case. We'll talk about it. It's 500 milliliters of air. So when you're sitting here taking that normal resting breath, 500 milliliters of air are entering into your respiratory system. And that's the key. 500 milliliters enter your respiratory system. Does all 500 milliliters of that get to the alveoli and get to participate in gas exchange? 
No, some of it stays in the bronchioles. Yeah, some of it stays, well, some of it stays in the nasal cavity. Some of it stays in the pharynx. Some of it stays in the larynx. Some of it stays in the trachea. Some of it's in the primary and secondary and tertiary bronchi and on and on. Some even get to the terminal bronchiole. That little bit of gas in the terminal bronchiole can see the respiratory, uh, uh, you know, a respiratory membrane from where it's at in that terminal bronchiole, but does it get to participate in gas exchange? No. No. So of this 500 milliliters that comes in, some of it gets to the alveoli and gets to participate in gas exchange, and some of it doesn't. And that's where our last two volumes come in. So when we talk about that tidal volume, while it is 500 milliliters of air that gets in, not all of it gets to the uh, gets to participate in gas exchange. Some of it, about 30 percent, and again, while the number 500 and uh, and 1500, uh, I mean, uh, 300, uh, pardon me, 500 and 150 aren't as meaningful. But what is meaningful and is that uh, that number is about 30 percent. About 30% of the air that enters in your normal resting breath does not make it to the alveoli and cannot participate, participate in gas exchange. And that volume that does not make it to the alveoli and does not get to participate in gas exchange, we call the dead space volume. About 70% of that resting breath makes it to the alveoli. And if it makes it to alveoli, it is going to exchange gas. And that part that makes it, again, about 70% of the normal resting breath, about 350 milliliters, is what we call the functional volume. So the functional volume is the portion of the tidal volume that makes it to the VLI and gets to participate in gas exchange. And again, you don't need to know 350, you do need to know 70%. Uh, and about 30% doesn't make it, stays in the nasal cavity, right? Only gets to the trachea, only gets to the bronchi and so on and so forth. And there we now have our 10 respiratory volumes and respiratory capacities. And so now, hopefully, there aren't any problems with that. Notice, I think we actually did a pretty good job as we look at the pretty picture here. Uh, go back to my whiteboard. Of being able to show the relationships of these values from that spirometer reading. But hey, we're not going to rely just on that alone. Again, you're gonna be doing this in your Physio X, so you're gonna be calculating. And the nice thing is when you're doing the Physio X, it does the calculations for you. It tells you the volumes, and I think it tells you most. It doesn't tell you all 10, but it does most. But you should, with values that are there, be able to figure out the rest of these volumes and capacities. Uh, but here we see, again, the descriptions of what these are. And, and, and what they can be, the respiratory capacities, the respiratory volumes you're gonna be responsible for. Uh, and then here is the pretty picture that shows their relationships. Now notice again, this doesn't show the functional volume and the dead space volume. So make sure you uh, can distinguish those as well, but what does show us everything else that is here. And again, those values that we gave, which again are average values for a male, but again, the numbers themselves aren't what's important. As it says here on the slide, the most important thing for you to be able to do is to be understand and remember the relationships. Know the definitions so you can define them if I ask you for them on the exam and know the relationships so that if I give you some basic numbers, you can do those calculations on your own. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. The last thing is while those are your 10 volumes and capacities involved in your normal and your exaggerated breathing, uh, there are also some non-respiratory air movements as well. 
like your book's got a nice table that talks about things, things like coughing or sneezing, crying, laughing, hiccups, yawning. All of these are examples of non-respiratory movements, as well as, of course, speech. Speech is a non-respiratory movement as well. So that ability to produce speech, uh, smell, olfaction, breathing in to smell that pie that's being baked, all of those are other examples of non-respiratory air movements. Uh, these are more involuntary ones, whereas our olfaction and our speech are voluntary, non-respiratory air movements. All right, questions on that? All right, believe it or not, that is all we have for lecture today. Like I said, today was one of those days where we had a big lab planned, and so we don't have as much normal lecture planned for today, like to, a day like today. Uh, but that is the material that I wanted to go through. So again, I want to really emphasize, uh, wait, where do I want to be? Um, to take advantage of the resources that are out there for you. So like I said, I really, really want to encourage you to spend some time uh, in your study area of your uh, Master in A&P. Uh, again, not only is this a chance to practice this material, to see the text, but like I said, really take advantage of the other activities. We just finished talking about pulmonary ventilation, your interactive physiology has a great exercise where it talks about this process. These great videos that do a really excellent job of showing them with much better illustrations. Well, I guess this is a little bit better than my drawing. So I really, 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 really want to encourage you to take advantage of things, these things to help you to be successful. And also now, like we talked about, while these things are fresh in your mind, the other thing that you can do is come here to your uh, PhysioX lab simulator. So notice as we, can you guys still see this? Yes. Excellent. Yep. Let's see if we bring that up. Again, we're going to follow along with the objectives. Uh, you're going to do all of these things. Uh, it's going to tell you what you're going to do. You're going to answer the questions. I'm going to race through them real quickly. Uh, and again, remember, just like before, submit these. But here's our lungs. So notice our airway uh, radius is set. Uh, and what we do when we hit start, is that as you can see it contracts and relaxes the muscles so it's flowing air and we can measure the movement of air as it is being passed through the lungs so we can see that and notice at the end of that it gives us our tidal volume oh and look at that lo and behold it's right at 500 milliliters excellent we can record the data from that as we get that and then notice what it's going to do uh, we want to clear our tracings, and then once we do that, as you follow the directions, what we're going to do is what I was going to have you do. You are basically going to start this for 10 seconds. As it goes for about 10 seconds, you're then going to take uh, a, a forced exhalation, and then you're going to take a massive inhalation and exhalation, uh, just like we did uh, on our illustration notice, they now give you the nice numbers here. They've done the calculations of some of your volumes and capacities, not all of them. The one volume and capacity we have not talked about yet is this one right here, a forced, uh, basically expiratory volume one. Uh, when you talk about COPD or other respiratory issues, uh, one of the things that we've talked a little bit about is resistance and the effect that resistance can have. One of the ways that resistance shows itself is not just how much air you can move, like the total volume, but how quickly you can move it. So what the FEV1 is, is it's showing how much air you can move in that first second of trying to force the air out. And so that number, and that's a number that you'll see is going to be significant as we change the airway radius as we continue to do these activities. Uh, so that's the one thing we didn't calculate. Uh, it's not one of the ones you're going to necessarily be responsible for calculating because, again, figuring out what one second uh, would be on this is not going to be something that's going to be easy. But it is a meaningful uh, volume that, you know, that, that we can talk about from a clinical standpoint and that you'll be playing with here. So again, you're going to record your data and then you're going to answer some questions and continue through this. 
So we're going to be basically, it, notice again, it does the calculations for you, it gets the numbers for you, so you can get this and go through it. And, and, and again, it, it, like all the Physio X's, it isn't incredibly challenging, it's just a bit time consuming. But now that we talked about this stuff and this is stuff is fresh in your mind, I would encourage you to start playing with it now. All right, so these are all resources that are here. Uh, in here that I strongly encourage you. Gas exchange, we're going to get to. This is going to have those numbers, I believe, that are going to be important that you're going to be responsible for that we'll get a chance to talk about. And then hopefully, uh, hopefully by uh, Wednesday, I'll figure out what the heck is wrong with my iPad or why it won't connect to the iPad and we'll move on from there. All right, so any questions on any of that? All right, so what I'm going to do is I am going to um, go ahead and stop the recording. Uh, today we'll have two recordings because again there was the because we did take that break in between as I tried to reset uh, the Zoom and that did not work properly. But I will try that again and hopefully we will get that uh, fixed. But so there will be two recordings from today. I will stick around for the next hour if anybody has any questions. Uh, again, I can talk to you about your current grades or what you need to do to be successful moving forward or if there's anything that you didn't want to ask about that you want to ask uh, then be recorded i won't be recording my office hours but i will hang out for the next uh, hour or so to give anybody the opportunity that wants to ask any questions so any last minute questions before we finish up all right i thank you guys uh study hard and i will see you when we're going to finish off the respiratory system on Wednesday, and then that means between now and I mean Wednesday and Monday, you're going to not only just start to master your respiratory stuff, including your anatomy, which we've talked about, but also start looking ahead at the urinary system. Uh, the urinary system has um, more histology, it has more anatomy, more microscopic anatomy. Uh, and just as much physiology as the respiratory system does. So it's going to be respiratory system plus. So make sure you are prepared for that by taking advantage of that time to study that. Again, uh, then the following week we'll do that. Then we have spring break. And then, I don't know, it's looking more and more like we may not be heading back to the classroom. Uh, so I don't know. I guess, like I said, we'll know a lot more of the next couple weeks. But one way or another, after spring break, either online or uh, in person, we will have one more lecture on the urinary system and then our exam. All right. Hopefully those are things that can help you guys to be successful. Like I said, I will go ahead and stop the recording, but I will stick around if anybody has any questions or, or, or wants to talk. And again, remember, while obviously uh, speaking is easy, but remember, you can use the chat and with the group chat, you can uh, send private messages to me and I can respond that way as well. All right, guys, have a good day, study hard. And uh, like I said, uh, since we finished a little early, I wanna strongly encourage you while this information is fresh in your mind, to start working on that Physio X. I know it's not due till next week, you have a week to work on it, uh, but I also want you spending next this weekend studying the urinary system. So doing it now while the information is fresh, basically is the alternative to what we would normally do in the classroom now. So please do that. All right, guys, have a good day and I'll see you Wednesday. Stopping the recording now.